Hey, this is Rich Bracken, and you're watching the Keynote Curators Podcast with Seth Deckman. So welcome to today's version of Curated Insights with Seth Deckman. Our guest is Rich Bracken, keynote speaker, author, educator, emotional intelligence expert, marketing expert, and so much more. Welcome, Rich. Thank you, Seth. I appreciate you having me. And I, I now realize that I have to grow more heads for all those hats that I, I wear on a daily basis. So <laughs> it's a good, that's right. Good I, I, left, I left out chief cook and, and bottle washer. Um, yeah. And all seriousness aside, I know all joking aside, I know that you were also a meeting professional. Yes. And given that I work with meeting professionals as a booker of speakers and you now as a speaker work with meeting professionals. Mm -hmm. It is amazing how much they do, as you said, so many hats they wear or that you wear, they do a similar thing. And I often say we call them meeting professionals because a miracle worker is already taken. That's that's very true. And it is it's a tough industry. And not only do they wear multiple hats, they wear them well, they change them with speed and grace. Uh, but yeah, having been a meeting planner myself, it gives me a different, unique perspective on how to interact with my clients and with my event planners that I work with. And true. The other thing, too, is that people don't realize how much stress meeting professionals are under. I recently did a keynote for uh, Meeting Professionals International where I talked about the fact that meeting professionals are the fifth highest stress job in America. The other wow. four are things like the military, police, firefighters. And, and so everything else, if a mistake gets made, there could be a fatality. And I joked, I said, you know, typically with meeting professionals, if, they, if there's a mistake in their world, there could be a fatality as well. So you, because you want to kill somebody, we're making sure they want to get all the details taken care of. But it is a high stress, very high demand. And especially in the last two years, a very stop and start industry. Things are just confusing. And so my love goes out to all of the meeting planners, having been one, but also for everything that they're going through. I mean, they don't get enough credit for what they do. Yeah. And, and I deal with them on a daily basis all day, every day. And I am continually impressed by the breadth of their knowledge base and the depth and alacrity, really, and the agility that they require to deal with, you know, 360 degrees of uh, demand all the time. So I want to jump in in the deep end there with you. Mm -hmm. I know much of your work currently that's been really exciting for you, we've spoken about is the whole idea of emotional intelligence. So maybe lay a foundation for you because emotional intelligence is a word that everybody relates to a little bit differently, but what, what it is for you, but specifically for meeting professionals and the importance of it in this pre-COVID, COVID, post-COVID, post no normal hybrid environment that we're in. Yeah, for meeting professionals, emotional intelligence is a critical skill. Most people call it a soft skill and I don't like that term. I like critical skill because it helps get people through the tough times. And so when you think about emotional intelligence, the quick breakdown is that it's self-awareness and self-management, which everybody needs, especially event planners, when you've got so many different things that are going on and there's changes, there's new demands, there's last minute you know, corrections to things, there are things that go wrong the day of the event. And so they're really having to manage their emotions and understand what they're going through, but then how do they react to things? How do they improve on the situation based on what they know and how they're able to pivot on a, on a dime with things that go wrong? And then it's also the social awareness piece, understanding, you know, active listening, communication skills, but then relationship management as well, not only with their clients, but also with their team members, the AV team, everything that's going on. Event planners and meeting planners do a beautiful job of managing all of those things. But really, we could all get better at emotional intelligence because emotional intelligence has 58% accountability for our performance. So over half of what we do well is attributed to emotional intelligence. Right. And, and again, you called it a critical skill or not a soft skill. Correct. Most times when you, when people talk about soft skills, they talk about communication and empathy and emotional intelligence and resilience. Those are critical skills. If you don't have those things, you're not going to succeed. So when they label them soft skills, it's kind of like, eh, it's the things that you kind of would want to have. Maybe it's nice to have. They're things that you add on to your intelligence or your acumen within an industry. But when emotional intelligence itself is responsible for 58% of your performance, I don't call that soft. I call that critical. Because if you don't have that, the 41% or the 42%, I'm not really good at math, the 42% of your acumen is based on your intelligence and your experience in the industry. Over half of it is how you deal with yourself and how you deal with other people. That's critical to me. Yeah. I mean, mission critical. We've heard that term before. 
And, you know, the word you used is it's the self-awareness, but then the management or the self-governance, or I don't know exactly the term that you used. What was the term you used? So it's self-management. So self-awareness is what are you feeling? But then self-management is what are you doing with that feeling? And then what I always tell people, especially when I, when I spoke with the, the meeting professionals, is that this is not intended. Emotional intelligence is not intended to make you oblivious to bad moods stress, sadness, anger, happiness, or, or otherwise. All of your moods are still going to come about, but that self-management piece helps you figure out what to do with that energy because we're going to get bombarded with things. We're going to have curveballs. We're going to have blindside moments for our emotions and our self-care. But when we're not managing the correctly, think about all the hotheads that you know in your life. Those people have a very low emotional yep. intelligence as far as self-management goes. And if you don't know a hothead, you may be the one. Right. <laughs> well, you know, the self-management, it, it's interesting. The phrase that comes to mind, Rich, is, you know, there's things that are outside of your control and things that are within your control. And managing oneself, or maybe one way to frame it is putting yourself in a position to be able to deploy or employ some really critical emotional intelligence skills or your capacities in the world of emotional intelligence. What are some of the things that each of us could do when we're getting bombarded, when there's a critical moment where emotional intelligence comes into play, apart from reading the situation and having empathy and everything else that comes into play, what can we do to put ourselves in a position for the things that we control to have us be successful in those moments? Sure. Great question. There, there are two things that I always talk about that are the critical pieces to really being able to manage any kind of a tough situation or, or an unpredictable situation with our self-management, with our self-awareness. Number one, go back to your game plan. Go back to what you know is true because so often we get caught up in the instance or the event or the curveball that happens. We wrap our mind around that. We forget to, we take, you know, we take our eyes off the prize as it was. And so if you focus on the things that are important, the tasks that are at hand, who is responsible for what you have a better outlook on how you can get back to the middle of the road to get to where you need to get to from a goal standpoint. Now, the other piece, and it's something that we all do and sometimes we forget to do, is breathe. We forget in yeah. situations like that when stress comes about, you clench up, you take a deep breath and you hold your breath. And chances are you're probably talking while you're holding your breath. That brings about more stress. You're immediately put in more of a defense mechanism situation because you're holding your breath, you're tensing up. But if you just take a deep breath and then react or then talk or then make a decision as opposed to panicking and tensing up, you're more apt to make a clearer decision. You're apt to more make a less rash decision, more rational. And it's really important. And again, it's something that we we have to do on a daily basis. We have to do on a, a second by second basis. But so many times we forget to do it in those tough situations. Right. It's like, how do you bring something that's automatic, like breathing or blinking your eye or swallowing into exactly. the consciousness? And, you know, it really requires a high level of self-awareness or knowing what the red flags are. Ooh, I'm sensing my body's tense. I'm sensing I have to react. It's a critical moment. And okay, I'm not just going to be reactionary. I'm going to breathe, take another measure, take another read and go forward. I would also add, and I think this was within what you were saying, but specifically when you know we're in these critical moments that require a high level of emotional intelligence and a moment of critical emotional intelligence is the nutrition aspect of it. Putting ourselves in a place where we're self-care, we're taking care of ourselves, we're getting the right rest, we're having enough white space, if you will. Do you, do you see that as part of the emotional intelligence, um, you know, important piece of that? 100%. You know, and, th and this is a lot of what I talk about as well is that it's not just the knowledge of what you should do and how you should do it, but it's also the placement mentally and physically to be able to do so. Think about the last time you were flat out exhausted. You're more emotional. You don't think as clearly. You're not able to bounce back from an adverse situation. You get more angry quicker and you stay angry because you can't rationalize your emotions. So the self-care piece of it is gigantic in this space. And people think, well, it's self-care. I don't have time to go to the spa for a full day. Not many of us do, although we would all love to, but really it's all about doing the little things to take care of yourself. It's not, you know, not booking back-to-back -back meetings on your calendar. It's implementing music intentionally in your day. It's exercising. It's meditation. I actually put together a document for my clients that has 50 things that you can do in under five minutes for your self-care to raise your emotional intelligence. And so those things are so critical and they're so easy to do. And most of them are fun. You know, if you think right. about just playing a song that you love, that's going to make you yeah. either sing, dance, smile at your desk, whatever that may be, it changes 
the chemical makeup of your thoughts, the chemical makeup of your of your mind, and it changes your physical reaction to this. So implementing those things on a daily basis, whenever you need to, or intentionally, just to make sure that you're keeping things even keel is absolutely critical to raising your emotional intelligence. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I just realized, Rich, that the next time we do this, I need to talk to your producer because you're not wearing the red jacket. So, you know, is it at the dry cleaners? Is it at the dry cleaners or something? Yeah, my, my closet looks like Batman and the Lego Batman where he's got the whole rack of the same outfit, right? right. It's all just red jackets. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, as I, as the year ends, you know, comes to an end is the red jacket has become something that I'm known for, but you know, we all, we all need a little bit of a refresh on a brand. Right. So there, well, may be a getting, new, there may be a new right. staple jacket emergency right. Out right now. You're, so you're any, putting some white coat designers out there. Right. Give me a call. I'm happy to be your brand representative. Right. Well, I do know, I do know a few tailors, so I'll send them your way, Perfect. but you send know, you're, you're bringing your own work to your own wardrobe. You're putting some space in between some of the wardrobe pieces, which is, you know, which is a smart thing to do. That way you right. get a little bit more mileage out of it. Exactly. I, I want to, I want to turn it a little bit from, you know, I want to hang in with emotional intelligence, but I want to build in something that I want to bring in your marketing experience. But in the context of social media, social media is powerful. You can use it as great currency to connect with clients, with vendors, with a community, expand your brand, communicate what's important, something like what we're doing right now. But there are pitfalls and Emotional intelligence in that arena couldn't be more important as well because it's harder to read tone and texture and we add meaning maybe where it isn't necessarily meant to be. How do you see that as knowing knowing you're a marketer and you use social media really in a powerful way? How do you layer in the emotional intelligence aspect to that? Sure. It's, it's a great question. It's something that needs to be talked about more often. Number one, I think the, the social media piece, although it's become one of the bigger cornerstones of our lives on a daily basis, can, you know, if, if used the wrong way, it can be, can be very detrimental to your emotional intelligence, to your mental health, too. So, number one, I always stress people that, you know, that you need to really take breaks, limit your time. As much as we want to be on there, it is constantly feeding you dopamine, but it's, it's almost like an addiction. It's raising you up, but it's bringing you down, and you have to constantly get into it to keep your, your levels balanced. And it becomes an addictive frame of mind. So as much as social media and, and digital media is really critical to marketing, it, you have to be really careful with it and how you ingest yeah. it and how you yeah. how you get into it. Um, I'm always a big proponent of looking at now your screen time that you're that you're seeing, not only with the screen time you have in general, but also the apps you're using. Um, so if you're not spending time in the right apps or you're spending too much time on something that is sucking the energy out of you, Think about the last time you got caught up in your Instagram feed and all of a sudden, 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later, an hour later, whatever it may be, you don't feel as good as you did going into it. You feel That's drained right. mentally It's because you've been looking at images and you've been subconsciously comparing yourself to other people. And that is detrimental to your, to your mental health. And right. so, yes, it's the best thing in the world, but it also can be a very dangerous thing if not used wisely. Uh, but really, when you go into it, if you go into it and with a mentality of that you, you're happy with yourself and you're not trying to compare yourself to other people, that is the best frame of mind to start any kind of an engagement with social media on. Because so often we look at images that are, they look perfect or they're heavily filtered or they're the, the highlights of this. And so this morning I even posted a video of me post Peloton ride. I looked disastrous at best, but I wanted to be real. Right. And I think now, especially from a branding standpoint, from a communication standpoint, those that are being authentic, good, bad, or indifferent, are actually seeing higher levels of loyalty. And this is from a business standpoint, an individual brand standpoint. Right. It's really critical to be authentic. Now, you don't have to go dump all of your sorrows on, on your LinkedIn page or on your Instagram. But you know, right. at the same time, show your struggles, show your frustrations, talk about the things that make you nervous, talk about things that you're learning, talk about areas that you want to grow in. Because people yeah. can relate to that. Nobody can, you know, not many people can say, oh, you know, the thing that drove me crazy and why I started my podcast originally was that I kept seeing images on social media of like, hey, do you like my new Lamborghini that I just started my sales funnel yesterday and I have now made $15 yeah. million. Let me show you how you can do it. I'm like, I call right. it BS all day long. Yeah. So I want to talk about the struggle, the growth, the, the journey of things, not, you know, paying respect to the success where success happens, but be right. real about it, be authentic yeah. about it. Yeah, there's a lot of pretense or there's a lot of inauthenticity said differently. There's a lot of ending. And behind that, it's like everything is awesome. 
But I wonder, is everybody happy? Oh, I I would say with an emphasis, no. I think they're yeah, I think I'm, number one, everybody's going through something. If you if you can clear in a way, say, especially the last two years that you've not gone through anything and that you're perfectly happy and the world is okay, I hope that that rock that you're living under has a swimming pool because it's right. it's it you, and you a jacuzzi. completely disconnected and, and checked out. We all are going sure. through things. We all have things that we're struggling with. And so I would say on the whole, most people are probably less happy now than they were two years ago. And you know, there's all kinds of research and data that supports that. But really, it's the journey of self-identification and self-happiness because we get so caught up in thinking, oh, if I go do this or if I get more likes or if I get this car or this job or this house or whatever, whatever you're chasing, whatever material right. thing you're chasing or image you're chasing, that's not going to bring you happiness. And I read a great book um, called The How by Ursa Daly Ward, where she talks about spend 20 seconds with your eyes closed and focus on the feeling of joy, pure joy. Mm. And think about what that feels like and then go through your day and identify the things that align with that feeling of joy. You'll have a happier day and a more productive day every single day when you try that method. Yeah. You know, you say that and it's so appealing. And I just try to put my mind into the swirl of social media and people think that's too long. 20 seconds is too long. Right. Because what what is the average attention span? Eight seconds? I'm like, I got to get that that twice. Or or there's another book I was reading by Brendan Kane, you know, three seconds. That's, you Mm -hmm. know, which is the algorithm that measures, I think, on YouTube or LinkedIn or, you know, Facebook or whatever. It's three seconds, you know, where you're either, you know, judged in or judged out. But it is, you know. I know you you talk on the the matter of authenticity with your brand and I've seen some of your clips and they've been very helpful. Some of the stuff, you know, frankly that I think a lot of us innately know or have seen, but the the refresh of it is great. Could you just hit on that? I think we could get a good 60 second clip about being authentic without being like preacher or whatever, but I I did watch your YouTube channel. I think yesterday I watched that clip and it it was, it was great. It was straightforward being humble. I I really liked that. Could you provide that for us? Yeah, absolutely. And authenticity is, is something that we have distanced ourselves from since social media, because we feel like we have to put up this front. We feel like we have to bring this image or this, this exterior brand to the world. And in actuality, when you put your phone down, if you put your phone down, when you put your phone down and when you reconnect with yourself, how authentic are you being? What is that comparison of that photo to what you're seeing in the mirror? And you, know, you will find all day long because I've been caught up in that before, too. And I know right. how it feels. Yeah, but there's nothing better than the feeling of being truly authentic. And again, good, bad and indifferent. You're going to have bad days. You're going to have struggles. We all do. You're not alone in that fact. So anybody who tries to pursue this feeling of perfection is chasing their tail and they will continue to chase their tail into oblivion. But it is absolutely critical that you buy into your authenticity because not only is it important to you, it's important to how you show up to the world. It's important to your relationships, your friendships and your business. So authenticity is the most critical thing you can possibly do in the best investment of your time. Yeah. You know, chasing your tail. It's like a booby prize too, because you're just going in a circle and you never have this, any victory is empty or fleeting. And, you know, you mentioned dopamine earlier in our conversation, but it really is a law of diminishing returns. How many more likes do you need? How many more shots of whiskey are you going to require to keep that buzz going? And when you let that veil down, and you're vulnerable, as I've heard you say so many times, it really is a powerful place. And you were unconstrained, you know, right. and, and, and there's a more full self-expression, if you will. And what I have found is, in some of the blogs that I've written is, when I've, I've, I've mentioned, you know, bedtime, struggling with COVID with my three daughters, and those are some of the ones that got the most uh, reactions and not only support, but that people connected with. As opposed to, you know, they've also connected with great business insights or other types of things. So it's almost counterintuitive, you know? Well, and and, and I agree. And I think you've had it, you've experienced it. I've experienced it. I've seen countless people that have experienced this where they've put up something. And even if it's one post, they put up something vulnerable, something real, something authentic. And that gets the highest engagement because people can relate to that. People at times, I've gotten more messages when I post vulnerable posts of people saying, thank you. I needed to hear that. I needed a personal reset. I needed to know that somebody out there felt like me. And that was the most important thing to me 
not only to show up authentic for myself, but then to give permission and give people the opportunity to feel that way too, to step into their vulnerability. You know, I there was a, a, a speaker that I heard one time that said, what I do is I provide opportunity to people. What they do with it is up to them. And so right. I'm posting and I'm giving you the opportunity to feel your own emotions and to step into your vulnerability. I'm doing my job. If I'm up there saying, hey, look, look at me do all my stuff. You could do it too. And it's so easy. And it's there's no struggle with it whatsoever. I am not serving anybody but myself. Right. And so that is right. a waste of time. Yeah. People feel identified with and they can recreate and, and it's a safe space. And that's a beautiful phrase because, you know, opportunity, you could use the word possibility. You can be inspired, you can be moved, but at the end of the day, you know, it's the individual that really has to take the action. Um, Absolutely. I want to, if we can take a little bit of a shift here, a little bit of a hard left turn or a hard right turn off of the road that we're on. And I think you're a self-professed LinkedIn nerd. Is that, I, I've, <laughs> yeah. I've heard you say that. Yes, I, I have said that in many an instance. So I am, I am yeah. a LinkedIn nerd. I love, love LinkedIn. Yeah. And, and I've, I've, uh, been doing a lot of activity on LinkedIn only for about the last six months. So I'm, I'm still in like kindergarten or nursery school, but I'd love to get your insight because I, I do notice with LinkedIn, the dynamic is, is that I don't know if the rules of the road or the tendencies or where you see kind of the herd, herd mentality of activity moving towards. There's a couple of spheres, you know, there are people that are just outright selling, um, yep. which I think is a little bit outside of the core intention oh of LinkedIn. Yep. Um, I'm being generous here. And then there are <laughs> others that, and then there are others that are for no malintention, but coming from a more Facebooky kind of world. And I say that hesitantly because I have zero presence on Facebook. Okay. Right. And then, and then there are those, you know, I would like to consider myself within there. I do read your posts and follow you and, and, you know, that are in the world of the network of LinkedIn and what that encompasses, interchanging, sharing ideas, um, alimentation, you know, feeding each other um, in a positive way to grow, you know, breathe life into each other. A couple of things, because I, I, I do hold you as, you know, a LinkedIn veteran expert, you know, what do you see that the trends are? Woohoo. You know, yeah, for exactly. speakers, for meeting professionals, for agencies, for any businesses, what would be your kind of end of the year? Hey, this is what I'm seeing. And this is what I think would be working going in. Sure. There, there are several things that, that I've seen work historically on LinkedIn. And I think especially now, so, you know, let's go back two years. I think LinkedIn self-professed and also the people that were active on LinkedIn were like, no, this is a business only platform. We're only talking about business. We're only talking about business over the last couple of years because of the pandemic and all the things that have come along with it. The idea of self-care, the idea of employee engagement, those, you know, the, the more critical skills, the, the communication things, the emotional intelligence things, the leadership conversations have become more prevalent in these posts. And so I think what, number one, what I'm seeing too, is not necessarily like I, I've seen people to go the true Facebook route where they're just like, they're posting things. I'm like, eh, you know, okay, I get it. Like you're trying to share something. I, I, I appreciate that. But you know, are you being consistent in that vein? If so, probably not the venue. But when people blend their self vulnerability within their business and personal brand, that to me is one of the most powerful ways to show up on LinkedIn. And again, like I, I will say 100% that I have created a network of people that I do that, but I also have surrounded myself with people that do that as well. Um, right. So that is, is number one. So be very authentic, you know, yeah, you know, some things are more appropriate on other platforms, but it's okay to be somewhat more vulnerable and personal because people need to hear that, especially people that are in a very business frame of mind. Number two, I think the critical nature of developing your network um, and I, I call it the Kevin Bacon effect, right? So it's okay. it's understanding that you are showing up as a as a as an individual brand, but how you interact with others is really critical. And you mentioned people that are out selling. I can't tell you how many people I've had messages from. Some oh. people get my name right, some people don't. I've had I've been called Stacy before. Like, try again with your copy and paste. <laughs> you know, it's it's really important that you take the time, slow down. And invest in the relationship, invest in time. If you're trying to win a client on LinkedIn, spend some time looking at their posts, read what they're writing, read what they're interested in. Because at the core of us, we all want to feel seen and heard and we all want to feel important. So if I feel like you're just blasting me an email that you've blasted to everybody else, 
you're not going to get me engaged. Now, if you go and say, hey, look, I've read, I read this post that you put up and I agree with what you said here. And I listened to your podcast and I love what you said here. And oh, I saw that TV appearance that you did. I thought that was great. And you said this thing that was really funny. Like, not that you're having to stroke egos, but at the same time, like I, that I would appreciate that. And I do that for other people. You know, I've reached out to people, whether I haven't, you know, a need to connect with them for business purposes or not, I want to support their content. I want them to feel heard because let's not also mistake the fact that, you know, somebody like me, who's a LinkedIn nerd, I post at will. Like I'm out, you know, like Yosemite simming it out there all the time, like putting up content <laughs> right. without fear. But there are some people that are putting their first post up. There are some people that are still trying to find their voice on LinkedIn. Right. So by supporting them, you're you're actually supporting their journey and, and helping them become more comfortable with the idea of sharing themselves. And that's huge. Absolutely yeah. huge. Yeah. Um, and the third thing is that you may not always be the answer to the problem. And what I mean by that is that I've coached and consulted so many people on LinkedIn that are like, well, I want this client and I, I want to sell them this. I'm like, well, do they need that? Right. Have you found that out? Or have you just said, what, are, what problem are you facing right now? What is the biggest concern that you've got going on right now? And if you right. sell service A and they need service D, you're not going to get that sale. But what you can no. do is leverage the Kevin Bacon effect. If you've got a network that they say they're, I'm looking for, um, I'm looking for a tailor for a new branded 2022 jacket. You know, that's right. Somebody may know somebody, but if you're not a tailor, you can't help me. You can't yeah. do that thing for me. Same thing with business referrals. Like if I can't help you do something like Seth, if you need something and I can't do it, but I know somebody who can, I now become a solution provider. I'm not necessarily trying to win you over on a service, but I'm saying, Hey Seth, your need is important to me. I know somebody that can do that. I did it this morning. And I, I referred somebody to somebody that I said like, hey, look, I'm happy to make the introduction because I know this person's really good. And I know that they would satisfy your need. I'm now yeah. looked at in good graces because I'm connecting the dots and I'm providing a solution to a problem. That is more valuable to me than trying to win every single sale, every single communication. And I think it's aligned and consistent and corresponds with kind of the original seed of LinkedIn. Mm hmm. Yes. And and, and, and and the overwhelming majority of people that have come into LinkedIn, whether they have the most basic subscription or LinkedIn navigator or whatever, they feel a little bit duped when people come in with another intention. And oh, absolutely. You, and you lose that social currency very quickly. Yeah. And and LinkedIn, you know, to their to their credit, has when you create a platform that gets that big that quick. You know, your, your ability to screen out all the bad stuff and, and try to come up with some sort of a best practice or a culture uh, driver of, you know, this is not allowed or not. This is very frowned upon. Right. You know, you hear people talk about right. all the time, like if I get cold sold one more time in my inbox, I'm going to scream. Right. Um, you know, we all go through that. That's part of the problem. But at the same yeah. time, that is when they hit a certain level, like, oh, there's. 700 million people on LinkedIn that are all business deciders. Yeah. Of course right. you're going to, it's like throwing chum yeah. at a shark tank and expecting the sharks to stay away. It's exactly, it's a great metaphor. And, you know, emotional intelligence, nine out of 10, when I get that, I either delete or I don't even, you know, I just move on. I'm like, eh, you know, you wasted your time and it took me one second to realize I'm not engaging and, you know, I move on. I'm, I'm not going to feed that my energy and get upset. Sometimes right. I get hooked, you know, like I, seriously, yeah. you think I need roofing? You know, that's what I'm, <laughs> that's what, you know, like I got one the other day, I think it was a tile contractor or something like that. I was like, oh, what? Yes. Like, yeah. What are you, what are you doing for your tiles in 2022? Like, how right. do you know that I have tile floors in my house? Right. Or I need them? Well, and what? so the positive way of looking at this too, and I don't do this all the time, but I've done it a few times and it actually has benefited me a little bit. But also I've helped out because I, you know, I've been a salesperson too. And so, especially if it's a, a younger salesperson and they're doing what they think is right. You know, sure. A lot of companies yeah. just say, I want you to send a hundred emails a day. Law of averages, you're going to get one or two people that are going to say. Right. And so sometimes when I get those emails, I'll say, tell me what prompted your outreach. Tell me what, why you think you can solve the problem that you assume that I have and tell me what your value proposition is. And by doing that, I'm kind of I guess I, I'm going to sound like my dad saying this, like I'm helping the younger generation become better. Um, yeah. you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to help them, but I also learned some things in the process too. Yeah. No, it's so funny. I did it yesterday and it's very out of my character, Rich, you mm -hmm. know, not like I'm this mean dude, but I'm the opposite, but I'm just like, I'll leave it. I'm not going to, I don't know if the word in my thinking is dignified with the response, but no, thank you. I, we use Salesforce. And mm -hmm. they market and I have subscribed to it. So 
And every once in a while, I'll download a white paper or I'll subscribe to a 30-minute webinar that they have on something. Mm -hmm. And invariably, every single time I download it, 20 minutes later from my rep who over the last 18 years, I've probably had 36 reps because at my level, like, you know, I get the newest guy on the block, right? (laughs) Right. And it's just this, you know, I'm sweating. I'm in my office here. It's just this unbelievable, like, templated, you know, reach out. Hey, I just noticed what more can we do? And they use the words like I would love to and all this stuff. And I wrote a thoughtful email back and Mm. I got crickets, but it was kind of cathartic for me. I took my time. I proofread it. I corrected some grammar. I didn't just like rip it off. Like, are you kidding me? You don't even think and da da da. I was like, I'm interested in what you have to offer, but I can't for the life of me figure out what it is you're offering other than you've lurked on my activity and you would love to talk to me, but about what I have no idea. So, you know, here's your chance. And I, you know, it was a little bit more elaborate than that, but, um, right. anyway, yeah. I can, a, word, we, a word of the wise, anybody who's got gated content, let it breathe. I mean, yeah. I, I get it. You're trying to strike while the iron's hot, but let it breathe yeah. and go in with questions and, and yeah. don't like, I would love to go again, like self-care. I would love to go to the spa for a day. Like nobody loves to set up time with right. somebody to talk about <laughs> right. sales funnel. Nobody loves right. that. Yeah. There's like, yeah. don't use the, be intentional, be very deliberate about how you use words. But again, like, I, I love that you did that because it also is, it brings back some positive energy into our minds that we're doing something very intentional so as opposed to just saying, how, you know, how dare you ask me if I need tiles or, you know, you're deleting it and you're annoyed. You're actually taking the time and putting some effort back into it. So there's a positive reinforcement to the activity for you and then for them too. Yeah. And I'm looking at it like, okay, this is absolutely something that doesn't appeal to me and is not in my wheelhouse of activity. But when one does come through that is attractive, and what I use the word is there is a spark. It's created a spark of interest. I'm like, hmm, let's dissect that at another time. And that's something that appeals to me. And I'd be able to borrow, if you will, and Mm -hmm. and lay over kind of my my style and personality on that. Rich, I think we're, we got a lot, we're over the 30 minutes. I don't want to rob your time anymore, but this was great. If you'd like to learn more about this speaker, visit our website at thekeynotecurators.com. There you'll find dozens of videos of speakers that are a perfect fit for your event. If you'd like to reach out directly, please click on the link below in the description. My name is Seth Deckman, and you've been watching Curated Insights.